today on The Novelizers. The last man on Earth's Will Forte. The Venture Brothers' James Urbaniak, plus Aristotle Athari and intern Kevin Carter. Now here's your host, Andy Richter. Do you know what I like about movies? Nothing. And you probably don't either. The problem is that even though almost everyone agrees with us, they end up going to the movies anyway. Why? Because there's nothing else to do. Wait a second, you might say. Why don't you read a book? What's a book, I'd say? Those paper things with words in them, you'd answer. I'd get all confused and I'd say, what, like a dictionary? That sounds boring. No, you'd say. I mean movie novelizations, like when someone makes a movie and turns it into a book. Then I'd feel real stupid and say, oh right, sorry, I love those. But where can I find them? You would then tell me about this podcast that I host, where we make people write novelized versions of some of the greatest movies ever made. And you would tell me how we take these novels and turn them into a podcast. Wow, I'd say, what a great idea. What do those guys call it? And you would look at me with a glimmer in your eye and say, The Novelizers. This season on The Novelizers, we've tackled the alien disaster flick, Independence Day. And here to catch us up on the story so far is my intern, Kevin. Yeah, so the entire Earth was under attack by aliens for no good reason. But when we try to blow up the aliens, our nukes just bounce off their shields. Jeff Goldblum finally makes a computer virus to take down the shields, and Will Smith flies it up into the main spaceship. It works, so pilots all over the world can finally fight back. But Will and Jeff are still stuck in the middle of the bad guy's ship. Thank you, Kevin. Today's first chapter was novelized by my buddy Scott Chernoff, who's written for Conan and Bojack Horseman and plays Gearhead on Rick and Morty. It was narrated by Will Forte from SNL, Last Man on Earth, MacGruber, and tons of other hilarious stuff. Will Forte, novelize us. Independence Day. Chapter 19, Check, Mate. Novelized by Scott Chernoff. Narrated by Will Forte With the once glorious spacecraft exploding spectacularly behind him, President Whitmore accelerated his glistening fighter jet in triumph. He'd never looked nor felt more manly. And damn it, why shouldn't he bask in victory's fiery glow? Only a few days ago, Tom Whitmore was routinely, mercilessly dismissed as a mediocre, super bland asshole with persistently low approval ratings. His first term political agenda dead on arrival, he was headed towards inevitable crushing defeat in a futile re-election campaign already besieged by scandal, gossip, and corruption. Like that one scandal about the fish, that was weird. But now on this new Independence Day, Thomas Whitmore had transformed into something entirely different. The hero who saved the world. This was going to be huge for him. Book deals, posters, children's bedspreads, the works. Sure, his dead wife's corpse was barely cold, but for the first time since the glory days of the Gulf War, Thomas Whitmore was alive. Now we know how to take him out, he bragged. General, spread the word. Luckily on the ground, there was indeed a general listening. That's cool, General William Gray responded, but like, spread the word how? I mean, communications are down everywhere except for this walkie-talkie headset thing I'm using to talk to you. Let's see, I guess I could get the Morse code guys back to their desks, if that's what you mean, but it was kind of a schlep to get them all here in the first place, and then we thought that they were done for the day, so we were like, okay, go do whatever, I guess. Because remember, it's not like you told them to stick around or anything. You didn't say, oh, we might need to do more Morse code again. You just flew away and we had to deal with everything down here on our own. So, you know, it's just a lot right now. But President Top Gun wasn't listening anymore. No one ever listened to General Gray. No matter, he was a survivor. Sure, Gray could have stuck with those other losers back when they were fleeing the White House. Half of them were probably dead by now. Not William Gray. He was too wily for that. He knew that if he really leaned into the whole general thing and said something sufficiently ass-kissy, something like, with your permission, sir, I'd like to remain by your side, the President Flyboy would think Gray was bravely and selflessly devoted to protecting him, when in reality what Gray had done was secure himself a primo ticket onto Air Force One and into the same ultra-secure bunkers as the boy president. 
They may not love you, Gray told himself, but they can't shake you. Not without a fight. And it worked. Gray was alive at the center of the action. The Morse code guys were still there too. They'd stuck around. Because let's be honest, where else were they going to go? And now was their moment to shine. Everyone laughed when they said they were going to learn Morse code, but now that same everyone had been incinerated by aliens, which seemed an exactly proportional punishment for the crime of laughing at nerds. Get out on the wire to every squadron around the world, General Gray barked. Tell them how to bring those sons of bitches down. As the Morse code guys started tapping away, the general once again became crippled with self-doubt. Should he have been more specific in his message? Sure, bring those sons of bitches down sounded super macho, which was his primary intention. But upon reflection, was it maybe just a little too vague? Gray got a bad feeling that maybe he was relying too much on the Morse code guys knowing all the details of the plan, such as how specifically to take down the aliens. It's not like he ever actually told them. And even if he did, was it safe to assume they had the ability to instantly communicate that precise information in multiple languages? Or wait, is Morse code its own language? Or is it like sign language, which is weirdly different in every country? Well, whatever, it was too late now. He'd said what he said, they'll figure it out. The Morse guys have got this. Just keep walking, Willie, and never look back. Meanwhile, up in outer space, there was tons of crazy shit still going on. Not for Steve and David, though. Sitting impotently in their jerry-rigged alien coop inside the belly of the mothership, Steve's mustache was all business. What do you think? He asked. David took a pause. Not quite a dramatic pause, more like a neurotic pause. Then, in that very David Levinson way, that I just figure something out, but instead of telling you what it is, I'll say something cryptic, but with purpose kind of way, David finally spoke. Checkmate. Steve looked David in the eye. Okay, what? He asked. Was that like a callback to something from earlier today? Because I wasn't with you then. I I think you were with Harvey Firestein at that point. It's like, okay, yes, I know what checkmate means and I can see how it could work in this context, but also who was that for? Because 100% it was not for me. Wounded, David went silent. So did Steve. What more was there to say? They may have saved the world, but they couldn't save themselves. Mostly because they were no longer on the world they'd saved. If they were, they would have been included in the saving part. But apparently, if you save the world when you're not actually on the world, it doesn't really pack the same kind of punch. It's a hard lesson to learn. Sitting in silence, Steve gently caressed the phallic symbol he brought with him on every mission. A humble cigar from a little place called Earth. David grabbed his cigar too. And the two unlikely buddies shared a smoke along with a good laugh about how anti-smoking David had been back home. The irony could only, and I do mean only, be described as hilarious. That was the only way to describe it. It's been a pleasure, Steve said suavely. Steve, you too, David replied, immediately regretting it. You too? What the hell was that, you moron, he thought. He's been a pleasure? Am I saying he's been a pleasure? David, get it together. Yet Steve was unfazed, like he didn't even notice or care, which of course wounded David even more. Instead, Steve extended his arm for one of those cool hand clasps that's more like a cross between a sideways high five and a fist bump, and David couldn't believe he was finally making a new friend. David attempted to reciprocate the gesture as though it was a regular thing he did, even though Steve was much stronger than him and it it totally hurt. Steve exhaled more thick cigar smoke into the small craft, which probably didn't have much oxygen left at that point, by the way, and zero ventilation. But sure, smoke it up. He fixed his eyes on David and said, There's only one thing left to do. David was paralyzed in thought again. What did that mean? Only one thing to do? There were so many possibilities. Was tonight about to take yet another unexpected turn? Is that what this movie ends up being about? He didn't know the answer, but he was only slightly afraid to find out. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? David asked. Steve raised an eyebrow, although no one could be sure which one. I don't know, he said. What are you thinking? Nothing weird, David assured him. Unless you'd be into something weird. Steve shrugged. 
We're in an alien mothership smoking cigars. I'd say things are already fairly weird. In fact, I'd say we're in, wait for it, alien territory. He flashed that winning smile and raised his other eyebrow. So now both eyebrows were up. You ruined it, David said quietly. Alien territory, Steve repeated with urgency. It's funny because it's true. David rose. He turned away from Steve and towards his 1990s Texas Instruments laptop running Microsoft Word and a Matrix screensaver in the background. He typed randomly, once again sending some kind of signal to the alien mothership, despite not knowing the Wi-Fi password and also using a computer that absolutely did not have Wi-Fi in 1996 anyway. But this is Jeff Goldblum we're talking about, so of course the plan worked like a charm. Operation Jolly Roger was a go. Operation Jolly Roger had three parts. Part one, send the aliens a gif of a pirate flag with a skull and crossbones laughing at them, which is a total own and one that transcends languages, cultures, and interstellar species. Two, taunt and shit talk the aliens in a really showy, assholy way. And part three, fire a missile at the nearest aliens, causing a chain reaction that, along with the second nuke he left behind, ultimately destroys the entire massive mothership. Parts one and two are actually optional if you don't have time for all three. The force of the action dislodged the Earthling's scrappy little ship, leaving them with 30 seconds to make it out of the mothership before the whole thing went kablooey which is the scientific term for when eels mate in unnatural ways, but is also used colloquially to mean boom boom. Can you get us out of here in 30 seconds, David asked with urgency as he shit his pants. Scrambling back into his seat, which he probably never should have left in the first place if he was planning to attempt a quick escape, Steve yelled, I ain't heard no fat lady. Fat lady? Now who's doing callbacks? David asked. But there was no time for an answer. There wasn't even really time for a question because they were under enemy fire and for the next 29 pulse-pounding seconds, Steve floored it as he deftly outmaneuvered hostile TIE fighters, flying his X-Wing through the trench in a desperate bid to outrun the kill shot from the proton torpedo he just fired into the thermal exhaust port. Well, it turned out 27 seconds would have been sufficient. Zooming away with about two seconds to spare, two seconds which could and perhaps should have been used for more banter, Steve and David blasted out just before the garage door closed. The mothership detonated behind them like the Death Star it was, which means that not only do we immediately get that this means the aliens are essentially defeated, but also that this is the climax of the story and it's all blah blah wrap up and celebratory medal ceremonies from here. Or so they thought. But after a delightful and totally necessary moment of timeless Elvis jokes and impressions, Steve and David's craft got caught up in the explosion and debris they'd been just barely outpacing. Maybe we shouldn't have slowed down to celebrate, Steve thought, as the flames consumed them. Death now appeared inevitable for David and Steve. Could they perish in the conflagration? And let's be honest, if they did end up dead... That really be so bad? From a story perspective, I mean. Yet even as the heroic duo's fate remained unclear, the people on the planet below were partying. Somewhere in Africa, a stereotypically primitive tribe rejoiced. In Egypt, a small crowd gathered by the pyramids. (laughs) Where else? To cheer the downing of yet another alien ship. And in Iceland, well, in Iceland, the battle raged on because no one there even bothered to learn Morse code. In fact, when they heard the tapping, they didn't even recognize the sounds as Morse code. And everyone was just like, someone turn that dumb old machine off. It's totally distracting us from getting our asses handed to us by the aliens. Back in America, there was jubilation as President Whitmore, followed by his fellow surviving pilots, boldly strode through a room full of cheering randos and embraced his daughter. Immediately, he was spotted by General Gray, who made a beeline for him. Jesus, Whitmore thought, this guy again. They're going down all over the world, Tom, Gray bellowed, suddenly on a first-name basis with the president of what's left of the United States. We got him beat. I mean, other than in Iceland, of course. But hey, they'll pull through eventually. They're a resilient people, the Icelanders. Uh, I wouldn't worry. So Tom didn't. But he did worry about Steve and Dave, despite his disappointment at how boring their names were. 
General Gray, of course, had to be the one to pipe up and give Whitmore the news, still striving to make himself seem useful. But telling Tom that he'd lost contact with Hiller and Levinson at the exact moment that their wives were walking up was yet another goofy gray gaffe, the latest in a long line of embarrassing faux pas. As he watched Jasmine's and Constance's faces fill with fear for their husbands, the general chastised himself. There you go again, Willie, he thought. You had to say it in front of the dames. No wonder you're 71 years old and still single. But not even General Gray could kill this mood, because suddenly Steve and Dave showed up on the radar, and everyone was happy again. Yeah. Luckily, Hiller and Levinson, who were in outer space just moments before, and who could have crash-landed literally anywhere on the planet, happened to touch down just a short drive from where all their friends were already waiting for them. That worked out perfectly, as it would have been a real bummer if they'd ended up in the middle of the ocean or on top of an erupting volcano or in some weird sex dungeon where they were held prisoner for the rest of their lives, or even just like a few towns away, which would be so annoying because they'd just have to take a bus or something to get back to the base. This way was much better. There was a big reunion out in the desert and everyone came. David's dad, Jasmine and her son, and even the dog because of course, right? Steve and David got to smoke their cigars. There were passionate kisses and proud salutes. And President Whitmore's daughter, who shall remain nameless, reminded us all that it was the 4th of July, which was pretty awesome timing when you think about it. Not only that, but uh, the still-falling flaming debris from the defeated alien ship on the horizon kind of looked like an Independence Day celebration. It was another amazing coincidence, and one that Steve saw as the perfect opportunity for one of his famous quips. He scooped up Dylan and held his now stepson aloft, gesturing towards the explosions in the sky. With a knowing grin, he asked, Didn't I promise you fireworks? Dylan pondered the question. It didn't sit well with him. These are not fireworks, the boy thought. This is the wreckage of a city-sized alien craft sent here to destroy the human race. Have you already forgotten what happened? They killed every single person I knew in the world besides you and mom, and that includes my real dad. Hello, he's dead now. And so are millions of people. All kinds of people are dead. I almost died in a tunnel. A tunnel! Not only that, but what about all the aliens on that ship? There are probably thousands of them. Sure, it's easy to devalue them as inhuman others, monsters. Yet were they not simply following their nature, exterminating for sustenance in much the same way we put ourselves on top of our food chain and and exploited Earth species and resources? Were these so-called alien invaders not individuals, each with their own families, joys, heartbreaks, stories to tell? manipulated by their political leaders into believing that theirs too was a cause that was righteous? And as they burn in front of us in this hellscape that was once our Eden, you're you're going to pull that cheap, sentimental crap about holiday fireworks? Like we're at fucking Epcot? Jesus Christ, Steve, read the room. All those thoughts raced through Dylan's mind in an instant, but as fully as he felt them, Dylan could read the room, and the last thing he would ever be in this moment or any other was a buzzkill. Yeah, because as everyone knows, Dylan's brand is fun, upbeat, positive, always keeping it light, and making sure mom is happy. She has it too hard and works too hard for him to let her down a lot of pressure and sometimes the burden can feel too heavy to bear but it was a responsibility he shouldered because he was the man of the house that is he was the man of the house until steve the big hero bringer of fireworks he of the pithy one-liner fine whatever now was not the time for recriminations dylan knew that better than anyone now was a time to move forward now was the time for Dylan to do what Dylan does. So he swallowed his feelings yet again, pretended this was a happy moment, and tugged on Steve's dog tag as he gave his answer. Yeah. Yeah, there were fireworks, and yeah, there was freedom, and as the stench of thousands of charred, rotting alien carcasses filled the air, the sky blazed on in a changed new world. Happy ID for everyone! Thanks, Will. 
Every week, my intern Kevin talks to one of the super talented cogs in the giant wheel that is Hollywood. Specifically, someone who worked on the actual film Independence Day. Kevin, who'd you talk to this time? I am here with a guy that goes by the name of Robocop, and he is the fight choreographer for the movie Independence Day. Um, Robocop. Uh, listen, is there something I can call you shorter? Because I'm going to mess that up. Uh, no, he's pronounced Ro- Robocop. Robocop. Oh, Ro- Robocop. Robocop. You call me Rob, if you like. Just call, just call you Rob? What you call, yes, you call me Rob. Uh, Petaweller. Yeah, Rob is good. I want to know, what the people want to know, um, what part of the movie, you know, were you doing the fight choreographing for? Chore- choreographing? Coordinating for? Most of the fight I for, I designed for this, this movie was cut at last minute. Uh, there is a part where this uh, Will Smith and uh, Mr. Goldblum, they don't agree about Alien, okay? And uh, Mr. Goblin says, I use my brain for to help him for the, be- the brain to, to tell you how in- to fight these people. And uh, uh, Will Smith say, no, I'm going to fight with my hand, my, 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 uh, my fist, my finger that I to, to take all my digits and turn into one ball and I put that in their mouth. And uh, then I, I designed that fight for them to fight together. Uh, that was cut. Uh, there was another fight that I have with um, uh, uh, Vivica A. Fox. Do you know her? Oh, Vivica A. Fox. My God. Uh, yeah, I do. I do know of her. Yes, I do know of her. So Vivica was, uh, I designed another brawl or battle between her and another stripper. So so let me, can I ask you a question? Um, a lot of these scenes that you're describing, me personally, Seen them? Are they are they deleted scenes from the movie and stuff? Yes, these are delete scenes. All the scenes delete. I designed the scene that doesn't delete them. Why? Why wouldn't they put them in the movie? Because they're too violent. They're too strong. They're too uh, bitchious. Why get into this profession? Like, why? Why get into this field? What about this intrigued you to where this is what you want to do for the rest of your life? Well, I originally started in dance. I was a uh, very uh, talent, but very good dancer. I dance for people. Uh, I learn uh, very quickly that uh, sometimes when you dance for people, they not appreciate your work, your art. Uh, and I had to learn how to defend my body. So I start to go to different um, school to teaching for me and uh, teaching for me how to 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 crash someone did you always know even from dancing you wanted to get into chore- choreographing fights or did it just like you just stumbled upon something like that no originally i wanted to be a corporate lawyer grow as a baby and uh, from beginning and then eventually i realized that dream is is not in star for me so um let's 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 go let's go after independence day tell me about you i want to know about oh. you Okay. Um, Where are you I'm, from? I'm I'm from Ohio originally. What is that place? What you said is you that hate place? that place. I said, what is that place? Oh, it's it's it's, it's called a, it's a state. It's a state within the United States of America because all the states were united together. You know, so so it's the United States of America. That's what that means. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Or are, are, are you are you, you not are you not from America? You do, you blow job my mind. I know my mind is not. Wow, I did not know this. Yeah, well, yeah, I I, I apologize for uh, blow jobbing your mind. So, anyways, so you're Scorpio, you're Scorpio. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm a Scorpio. Yeah, what does that mean? That mean you have a high sex drive? I think there's more to it, you know what I'm saying? But I, but the one I stop at is high sex drive. I'm like, good. Yes. Was there anybody, any actor or actress that? When when you think about what you do, when it, when it's involving the dancing and the fighting, you know, and being fluid, being able to make it look real and everything like that, was there anybody that just couldn't get it right? That they that it was very hard to train them. Was there anybody like that? Charles Grodin was very good, actually. Charles who? From Charles Grodin. 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 He okay. was in Midnight Run. I worked on Beethoven, which was a, another 
Uh, Beethoven, what? the movie with the with the dog. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it was a good one. Yeah. Good one. Uh, let's see. And uh, ID four. Uh, you know, uh, Randy Quaid. Very difficult to work with. Randy Quaid. There was a fight scene where all oh, this. It didn't make it. It didn't make it. it didn't make Everything it. got cut. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Everything sorry. got cut. Yeah. Um. I want to thank you, uh, Robocop, for this interview portion. I, I really appreciate it. It was good to to learn. You know, saying from you and understand the, the the things that you do. You're a very important person in, in this Hollywood business. We appre- we appreciate you being here. I appreciate you being here too, and uh, thank you so much for your time for this interview. And I hope you have a great time, and I will continue the show. Okay? You're an amazing thank man. You. Thank take, you. Thank you. All care. right, everybody. You, um, this so is. I'm uh, gonna s- What's that? I'm gonna I'm gonna stay, and you go. Okay. That hold, wait, wait. That's not. That's not how. That, that's not. That, that's not how that works here. Um, Today. I, I I normally do my. I normally do my. We got to go moment. My my call off. My sign off. I mean, I do that, and then and then and then and then it's over. Then then you get off, and I, I stay on and stuff. You, you leaving? I stay. No. Yes. No. Yep. You know what? Yep. Yep. That's that's what we're gonna do. That's what we're gonna do. Everybody, uh, I'm gonna get off of here, and uh, yeah. you're gonna be here with Robocop. Uh, I have cool. been. Yeah, I've been Kevin Carter. Everybody, please enjoy the rest of the podcast. Okay, that was Kevin Carter's legs, and he was here. You are on air with Roboco. This today, we're going to talk about the weather and also going to talk about why is it like so hot. Well, our film's over now. But what happens to our characters after the curtains close? I'm not talking about the sequel, mostly because I never bothered to see it. I'm talking about an all-new epilogue written just for the novelizers. Our epilogue was written by Anita Sirwaki, writer for Word Girl, and narrated by James Urbaniak, who you know and love from the Venture Brothers, the Fablemans, and Oppenheimer. Classy. Mr. Urbaniak, novelize us. Epilogue, novelized by Anita Sirwacki, narrated by James Urbaniak. August 30th. Mankind's great victory of July 4th was now in the rearview mirror. The parades were paraded, the solemn ceremonies snoozed through, the commemorative coins minted. But it was finally time for the world to move forward, considering that August is freaking hot, at least in the United States, which is all that really matters, and the planet was littered with smoldering alien and people chunks. People of Earth, we must begin to deal with this stank, announced President Thomas. The smell. Jesus Christ, who knew victory would make the whole damn planet stink like roadkill in a Bourbon Street gutter? Area 51 was now the de facto White House, still surrounded by the RV kooks who were milling around the parking lot, itching for something more to do since they were at last proven right and now faced the grim fact they had no more purpose and still lived in RVs. President Thomas sat, head in hands, at a shitty metal desk containing a large active telegraph system. David Levinson robotically spun in circles on a nearby office chair. Squeak! 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 went David's chair. Beep, 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 went the telegraph. David had been appointed to lead cleanup operations, as he was still pretty much the only one who gave two craps about the environment in the entire country. Here I am, rock you like an eco-cane, David sang in his head while grinning to himself. Squeak! The men were convening with surviving world leaders and some guy named Nigel who took advantage of the chaos to crown himself King of Australia. With satellites still out, communication continued to be conducted by telegraph, and it took fucking forever, as Nigel had difficulty making any goddamn point and really liked to hear himself beep-beep-beeping. It wasn't easy interrupting someone on the Morse code rant. Nigel's bullshit and David's infernal spinning were giving Thomas a headache. He slapped a hand on the shitty desk. Okay, can we shut this thing off? Put a blanket over it or something? Turning to David. One more spin and I'm putting this fucker through your skull. The normally even-keeled president wasn't usually so nasty, but he had some very heavy decisions to make. Removal and disposal of alien debris was the top priority. 
The UFO crash zones were covered with toxic gelatinous mounds that smothered all vegetation. The decaying alien flesh also seemed to have a corrosive property that was destroying the soil like salt on a field. Despite this, and maybe even because of it, a black market for alien bits had also sprung up. Some real sickos were paying top can goods for more intact harvester corpses, presumably to have unnatural relations if you get the drift. The exosuit head tendrils were particularly prized. No one really gave a shit if these perverts contracted some kind of intergalactic crotch rot, but having this material out in the wild could create any number of contamination zones. And it was a little too early for wealthy weirdos to start wrecking the planet again. Locations were being chosen for dedicated ET pits, places no one really gave a shit about, that could be filled with space corpses and easily abandoned as everyone wiped their hands of the whole mess. On the call, Nigel was waffling between Australia's Point Augusta and Townsville, which was probably the most times the phrase bloody cunts was transmitted via Morse code. David made one more grating, squeaky spin on the chair, and President Thomas punched the telegraph in frustration. The president's knuckles were bleeding, but the squeaking ceased. David alluringly raised an eyebrow and pointed a confident finger at Thomas. Bakersfield, Roanoke, Black Rock City, Paramus, just terrible, terrible places. He blew imaginary smoke off his finger and resumed spinning. Thomas exhaled. Relieved, the burden of choosing E.T. pit locations was shouldered by David, and he agreed. Bakersfield was garbage. September 7th. To take a bit of the sting out of having more towns wiped off the map by toxic alien sludge, President Thomas made a proclamation that each E.T. pit was a solemn sacrifice, to be named after a beloved, downed hero. Russell Case got Black Rock City and Captain Jimmy was going to get Bakersfield, but Captain Stephen objected because fuck that place. At the end, Jimmy got Roanoke, and Bakersfield was left undedicated because fuck that place. Finally, it was time for David to raise a bullhorn and address the RV throng. Weirdos, do I have a job for you? Soon after, the RV UFOologists were again mobilized. Using their extensive clip art libraries and mimeograph capabilities, they were tasked with creating volunteer-seeking flyers, which would be airdropped over all populated areas within 300 miles of crashed spacecraft. Along with hazmat gear and shovels, volunteers would be provided with government food rations, consisting of cans of Dinty Moore stew and mixed vegetables. Libby's even, not a store brand. Those who didn't step up were on their own and were welcome to join one of the numerous roving cannibal gangs that had most certainly formed by now. September 8th. A helicopter descended into Black Rock City. David, in galoshes and hazmat suit, nervously stood over the Russell Case Memorial Black Rock City E.T. pit as an ongoing sluice of toxic chunks slid from the backs of dump trucks into deep, deep holes. I'm very happy that you're, um... Helping in this important mission, David nervously announced before getting the hell out of there. Heading into the sky, back to Area 51, he knew all those poor schmucks would be dead before they consumed their dinty more rations. Decaying harvester corpses were way more toxic than they let on. But it was goddamn necessary. Also, having government power was pretty fucking sweet. September 9th. David returned from Black Rock City, a little angry, a little resentful, a little sad, maybe kind of remorseful. Guilty? Probably. But confident. Entering the White House, he approached President Thomas to give him the Black Rock news, but was faced with an oddly silent shitty desk. What happened to Nigel? asked David. Someone shot him in the head. Sure, not surprising. Who's in charge of Australia now? Not sure. We're getting messages from someone who may be covered in spiders. October 1st, President Thomas breathed deeply and immediately regretted it. Amateur mistake, he chided himself. Now he'd be smelling Chinatown fish market on a hot summer day for the next few hours. Despite the rot stink in his nose, President Thomas was pleased. David was organizing the E.T. pits. The economy was starting to chug along. Maybe this planet was going to be all right after all. 
Then the telegraph sprung to life. Apparently, Nicholas Cage had declared himself king of Bakersfield, demanding retribution. President Thomas shook his head. This shit never ends. Maybe he should have just let those aliens rape the planet. He laughed to himself. It was too late now. He typed out instructions to his generals to take out King Cage. President Thomas smiled. It was more of a smirk, but he realized it was the first time a smile had crossed his face since the new Independence Day. Maybe things were going to be all right. The telegraph exploded again, this time from the new King of Australia, Yahoo Sirius. For fuck's sake, Thomas exhaled. Then he sat at his desk and cried. Thanks, James. Well, that's it for our season, but we will be back with more novelizers soon. What film will we tackle next? Well, you just gotta tune in and find out. Okay, it's The Matrix. Thanks to all our writers, narrators, and improv superstars. But most importantly, thanks to you. Without whom this whole podcast, it wouldn't even exist. Wow, thanks, Andy. I, 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 don't, I don't know what to say. No, not you. I was talking to the listeners. Jeez. Right. Uh, thanks, listeners. Oh, chucks. All right. Thanks to you, too. Happy to help. Uh, nope. I was talking to different listeners. Damn it. Kevin, land this spaceship. And thank you. You're welcome, Andy. And thanks to this week's guest contributors. Scott Chernoff, Will Forte, Aristotle Athari. Anita Serwacki and James Urbaniak. More info about all of our guests can be found in the show description. The Novelizer was created by Stephen Levison, produced by Stephen, Chris Karwowski, Rob Kuttner, and Suchetta's Bokil. Editing, mixing, and mastering by Chris. Improv by Christine Bullen. Music by Cole Imhoff. Art direction by Crystal Dennis, with illustrations by Barry Crane. Intro narration by Robin Reed, and interviews by me, Kevin Carter. Special thanks to Luke Dennis and Peter Hayes at White Soul Public Radio in Yellow Springs, Ohio. Check out thenovelizers.com for more info about the show and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and occasionally TikTok. If you enjoy The Novelizers, please support us on Patreon or email thenovelizers at gmail.com to sponsor an episode. Till next time, people, I'm Kevin Carter. <laughs>